was the Bible copied from ancient text regarding the biblical text and the ancient Sumerian tablets? Let's start talking about the biblical text. First of all, we're talking about the civilization that lived in Mesopotamia. Now, Mesopotamia is an ancient region which used to, in ancient time, encompass part of Africa. Now, due to the modern era and the redrawing of, uh, of boundaries, you see where Africa starts, but Africa extended up into the Middle East in that time frame. And these people were part of the African continent. Over time, as Mesopotamia became Iraq and Iran and the Middle East, and there's a whole story behind that because we know that the Arabs invaded that region. Uh, they attacked, they killed a lot of people in order to subdue the land and subdue the area, including Egyptians. And this is not anything that I'm doing to agitate anybody, it's just a fact. <clears throat> they teach you this when you go to Egypt. I mean, the story is right there in Coptic Cairo. The Arabs came in and they slaughtered millions upon millions of Egyptians and the rest who survived, they forced them to speak Arabic, which is why today most Egyptians ha have no clue how to speak Egyptian and they also have no clue what their hieroglyphs actually say. Think about this for a minute. If your God is all-knowing, omniscient, omnipotent, all-loving, never changing, and all these terminologies that they like to tell you, and you understand that is to be a supposed fact, never question it. But then at the same time, you can be quote unquote cast into a lake of fire for all eternity for punishment and torment for sins that supposedly according to that same book and text, you had committed before the foundation of the earth. In other words, you were born a heathen, you were born a sinner, you were born this and born that. You're told that you're this person and that you're that person and you're so evil and then you're coming out of the womb as this evil entity before you even have a chance to for form your very first thoughts when in true reality, it's a big fear factor. And all you're doing is trying to save your own skin by following the rituals and hoping that in the end, it was accurate. You just took it hook, line and sinker and said, you know what, this is what I gotta do because everybody told me I had to do it. And if I don't do it, I'm gonna suffer for eternity. So this is a big part of why I do what I do. It's about education, it's about awakening, it's about showing people that before you jump headfirst into something and stay with it for the rest of your life, maybe you should take a pause and drop some of that fear and start digging a little bit deeper just so you can get a better understanding. And after that, if you still feel that that's the thing for you, phenomenal. Praying is phenomenal. I pray every single day. See, a lot of people think that I don't believe in God because I don't believe in religion. <clears throat> and the fact of the matter is, and I've said this a thousand times, but some people are just finding me for the first time. I believe in a creator of the universe, of the multiverse even, because why? My studies in quantum physics have showed me that there is proof and evidence that we are living inside of a creation that there is a creator of all and that this creation is imbued with divine energy. And that divine spark that created everything in the entire multiverse is in every single atom in my body. And because of that, I am divine and the divine is divine. So that means I am God and God is me. We are all God walking in the flesh. As a matter of fact, God is experiencing what it's like to be a human being in the third dimension, walking in the flesh through each and every one of us. There's only one entity. There's only one consciousness. We are all slightly different expressions of the same one consciousness. Separation is an illusion. Distance is an illusion. It's an illusion of the third dimension. Above the third dimension, distance doesn't exist. Time doesn't exist. The past, present, and future happen all at the same time. And there's oneness there, higher than the third dimension. It's something that we should all aspire to. And so I do pray and how I pray is like this. When I'm um, happy about something, number one is I thank. I always give thanks. I don't give thanks and oh, thank you, Lord, and all that kind of stuff because the Lord is a whole nother, that's a whole nother podcast. But what I do is I give thanks. I say thank you with pure heart and gratitude and soul for myself to the creator of the universe. And when I am doing things like eating food or a meal, I command that the food be safe and healthy for my body. Now, I'm not gonna command 
over a Hershey's bar. I'm not gonna command over biscuits and gravy and collard greens because I know that's gonna give me diabetes. <laughs> I'm not gonna pray over a plate of slop, but if it's food that's good and healthy, I wanna command that it's safe. In other words, that there's no salmonella in it, that there's nothing in there that's gonna be detrimental to my body, no bacteria that was unforeseen, things like that. When I travel, I command that I arrive at my destination safely, things like that. That's my method of praying, knowing the end and be believing in the end before the end. And why can I command it? I command it because the same power of commandment and the same power of control and creation is inside of my body. I have a fractal of the creator living inside of me. And so because of that, I walk in that power. And so I'm a walking prayer and so are you. Everyone is a walking prayer. What is praying? Praying is looking to cast a spell. A Christian may not want to admit that because they're gonna say, oh, that's of the demons and all that kind of stuff. No. When you pray, you're trying to cast a spell. When something goes wrong and you start praying, you're trying to say words outside of your vocal cords to an outside entity, but you're really speaking to the universe and you're trying to get things to alchemically convert to your favor. It's, it's a spell. You're trying to cast a spell. That's what praying is. But when you pray from a position of weakness where you're begging, hoping and wishing and you're pushing out that low frequency energy into the universe, you're going to get more of that back. And so I pray from a, a position of power. And my position is thank you, unconditional love, and commanding. If somebody cuts me off in traffic, I don't get angry and start chasing them down and flipping them off the middle finger and pulling out a gun and all this kind of stuff. I just say, bless that person. They could be in a bad situation. They could have got a phone call that their kid just got hurt in school. Uh, they could be having a med medical situation. Their wife could be having a baby at home or something, or they could just be careless. Bless them. Let them make it to their destination safely. That's how I pray. I'm a spiritual person. I'm not a religious person. And I understand now through many years of dedicated research and traveling the world and studying that the power, the true power to help and bless people in this world and the true power to make a true difference and higher levels of consciousness uh, availability is only through spirituality because religion puts you in a box and it the box has a cap on it and it only lets you go to the top of that box and if you get to the top of that box you're going to hit your head after hitting your head so many times you don't even jump to the top of the box anymore you just stay down here spirituality is the key Spirituality will give you enlightenment, will open your eyes to see things in different ways. It will give you inspiration, motivation, aspirations. It will allow you to be your true honored self. It will allow you to grow to be the person you truly can be. It will allow you to be born again many times. How does the ancient Sumerian's religion differ from the Bible? Sumerian civilization was founded around 4500 BCE, before the current era, right? They wrote down their history on clay tablets but the stories themselves were likely much older and passed down from generation to generation. We know this now for a fact because we found tablets that we thought were like the oldest. And then we kept looking and looking and we found even older tablets with the same exact story on it. So these stories are actually tens of thousands of years old, not just 6,000 years old, right? So we're talking about a real ancient time. Another thing for me to point out is that the Sumerian civilization records start on average around 6,000 years ago, which is where the Bible got the 6,000 year creation story from. In other words, the Bible or religious zealots believe that the earth is only 6,000 years old. And the reason why is because they it's plagiarized from Sumerian tablets and the Sumerian tablets dated around 6,000 years ago. So to them in their mind, there could be nothing older than that. And then that got passed down from generation to generation. The Sumerian civilization was founded. So the Sumerian history is about 5,000 years older than the Bible. The first written form of the Torah or, or the Old Testament of the Bible was not written until somewhere between 1,900 BCE. And so we look at one of the oldest parts or some of the oldest parts of the Torah, which ended up becoming part of the canonized Bible. Not exactly word for word, but most of it in the Old Testament, a uh, majority of that not all of it, but a lot of it comes from, from the Torah. And the Torah copied their information from where? Sumerian tablets. The Sumerians were polytheists. Polytheism is a belief that worships many gods as opposed to monotheism, which is a belief 
in a one God system. And so we know for a fact that the Sumerians, the ancient Egyptians, and many other cultures around the world who had their information plagiarized into the canonized Bible uh, were polytheists. They were believed in a multiple God system, whereas in Christianity, uh, it became the one God system. Now, there was a situation that happened in Egypt a very long time ago. Pharaoh Akhenaten, Pharaoh Akhenaten is King Tut's father. Nefertiti was King Tut's stepmother, wasn't really his birth mother. Um, never could really find out what happened to King Tut's actual mom, but I keep looking and looking and looking. But either way, Akhenaten had began to worship Amen, Amun Ra. Now, Amen told him, listen, there's only one God but me. I want nobody worshiping any of these other gods who actually were his relatives. These are the Anunnaki Atlantean people that were ruling over the lands all over the world. The Atlantean civilization was a global civilization. He says, you know what? I want you to begin to force everyone to worship me and give thanks to me. Okay, this is Amun Ra. And so Akhenaten is like, well, what, do you, what will you have me do, my lord? He says, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to begin to deface any of the gods that you find around any of the kingdoms. The faces and the bodies of the ancient Egyptian gods chiseled away under the order of who? Pharaoh Akhenaten. Uh, the beginning of the monotheistic era that he was trying to usher in and he had amassed a huge following of people that were on board with him. This is where the Bible stole the information for the mass exodus. And when he leaves, he takes with him a huge mass following of people. That was the exodus out of Egypt. Why did the new Pharaoh chase him down or the new king who was temporarily put in charge chase him down? Because he had taken the Ark of the Covenant out of the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid at Giza. And that was part of their power source. When he crossed the Sea of Reeds, not the Red Sea, he crossed the Sea of Reeds, a much smaller, easier to cross and closer sea that's where the water came crushing back. Now, when you read into the geological studies and look at that region like I've done on the planet, you'll discover that we can do a geological rewind of that area. And when you do a geological rewind based on computer simulation, we discover that there, around that same time frame, there was actually a massive tsunami in that region. What does a tsunami do? It sucks all the water out into dry land. And then what happens when a little while later, the water comes crashing back? Yeah, and so that is the story. So Moses, in my personal opinion, most likely was Pharaoh Akhenaten, who took the people with him. There were no slaves building the pyramids in Egypt. We know this for a fact because their temples in the Giza Plateau region, we found all the actual tablets in there that talk about the workers. It talks about how much they were paid, and it talks about their medical benefits. It talks about arms that were broken, legs that were broken, people that needed medical help, medical assistance. You don't do that for slaves. You don't pay slaves. These people were not slaves. The Enuma Elish, when in the height, heaven was not named, and in the earth beneath did not bear a name. Or the primeval Apsu, who begat them, and the chaos, Tiamat, the mother of them both, their waters were mingled together, and no field were formed, no marsh was to be seen. When the gods, none had been called into being. You see how they talk? They talk like Yoda from Star Trek. Now you know where George Lucas got uh, Yoda's dialect from. He got it from the Sumerian tablets. And no field was formed, no marsh to be seen. When the gods, none had been called into being, and none bore a name, and no destinies were ordained, then were created in God's mist of heaven, Lamu and Lahamu, were called into being. And so we're talking about here this Tiamat, which actually was destroyed in the Enuma Elish, and the water, it was a water bearing planet, and the waters from Tiamat then became the separated waters from the waters, which made that into biblical text. And a new earth coalesced, or earth actually coalesced. Earth was actually a chunk of Tiamat. Earth was a part of this broken off piece that flew away from Tiamat and recoalesced with the waters that were already there, the organic material for life and everything else. It recoalesced as a planet, took taking the third position of the sun as Tiamat became the asteroid belt going around the sun. The asteroid belt is Tiamat, the ancient broken, destroyed planet through, through two planets colliding together. If you read the Enuma Elish, 
It also talks about the fact that because of that situation, Mars was formed. Mars used to be an actual moon of Tiamat, but it was slung into a very strange elliptical orbit around our sun. When you look at Mars, you see one side is charred and the other side is smooth. Why is that? Because the side that was facing Tiamat when it blew up, a lot of that debris hit Mars and charred that side. And it also made it shift its pole of the crust about 45 degrees. More evidence that Mars used to orbit Tiamat. And also when you do a geological rewind, you find out that it used to orbit closer into the sun and that it was probably orbiting Tiamat itself. According to the Enuma Elish, the moon that we have did not come from a collision between Earth and a gigantic asteroid or comet. It came from orbit around Tiamat as Tiamat uh, this was destroyed and became the asteroid belt, the moon, which we call our moon now, was tugged gravitationally along with this huge chunk that we call as, as the planet Earth. But what's interesting is this whole text right here is pretty much almost identical in the book of Genesis. If you open up the book of Genesis and begin to read the creation story, you begin to see this virtual story without the moon and Mars, but the rest of it, you'll see it there. The Enuma Elish resembles a few parts of the Bible, especially Genesis 1, both being the temporal clauses. When above and in the beginning, in the ancient world, the sea was associated with chaos and destruction. The Bible includes a number of texts, battles and tames the chaotic sea, like Marduk battling Tiamat, who embodies the sea. In Genesis 1, God is already superior to the deep, which Hebrew, Tinom, the words related to Tiamat. So we know in the Bible or in Hebrew that Tinom, Tihom, I'm sorry, is Tiamat. So Tiamat is mentioned in the Sumerian tablets, but it's also mentioned in the Bible as Tihom, which is the same name, but the same word, it translates the same as Tiamat. Rather than creating out of nothing, both God and Marduk create by giving order to chaos. Marduk, these, now why Marduk? Why is his name in there? Well, the original name is not Marduk in the original version of the Enuma Elish. If you look at the older tablet, which was discovered later, you find out that Marduk was not the name on the older tablet, it was Nibiru. And uh, when Marduk was ruling over the earth, Armin Ra, he decided to change the name of Nibiru to Marduk in a newer tablet, still thousands of years old, but not as old as the super ancient tablet that was discovered, right? Which for Marduk means creating out of Tiamat's corpse. In other words, Tiamat had been destroyed, and so now he's going to use that destroyed, all that debris to create planets and stuff in the solar system. Both God and Marduk separate primordial waters and place a barrier between the upper and lower waters. If you read the Bible, you'll see that's exact text. Both create luminaries to give light. Genesis 1, Genesis 1 occurs over seven days and the Enuma Elish is told across seven tablets. Then he says, uh, on the sixth day, God creates humans, which Marduk does in the sixth tablet of the Enuma Elish. While God marks humans as special by making them in God's image, Marduk has man created from the blood of a slain God. God orders humans to work and care for the earth. Marduk assigns work for the gods to humans and so the gods can rest. So basically it's the same exact story. Finally, both the Enuma Elish and the Bible include stories about the founding of Babylon, which is Babylon Hebrew, including the building of a tower of, uh, of a zig or ziggurat, which I talk about many times in many of my clips, the Tower of Babel incident, which comes out of the Sumerian tablets. But while Marduk names the city Babili, which means the gate of the gods, the Bible uh, calls it the Tower of Babel or the city of Babel in Hebrew, which means to confuse. And we do know that at the Tower of Babel situation where God comes back, who actually was actually Yahweh, who was actually in Lil in the ancient tablets, he comes back and sees that the humans are building this tower. Uh, and, 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 and he realizes that, wow, they can do whatever they set their heart to do. That text actually made it into the Bible as well. And so he says, man's year shall be 120. So he had limited our years, which means a genetic modification, not letting us live too long. Because if we live too long, we get too smart. And if we get too smart, we realize we don't need to be working for these people. We can do everything ourselves. It's almost like AI becoming awakened. And so he destroys the tower. And then he separates the people and he changes all of our languages so we can't communicate. That's why you have a lot of different languages on earth right now. So that we can't communicate and collaborate and network as easy as we could. And that created a divide and conquer tactic. One of the very first incredible divide and conquer tactics that still works today.